Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Vijit Jain from City Research. Welcome to FSN E-Commerce Ventures Limited 4Q FY22 earnings call. From the management at NICA, we have Ms. Falgini Nair, Executive Chairperson, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer. We have Anchit Nair, Chief Executive Officer, Beauty E-Commerce. Uh, Advita Nair, the co-founder and CEO of Fashion, and Arvind Agarwal, CFO, uh, will also join the call shortly. I'll now hand over the call to Fagani for opening remarks in the presentation, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Over to you, Advita. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vijay. Uh, I just uh, am really happy to be here uh, in front of the investor and analysts for this call today. Uh, and while I'll take you through our uh, uh, detailed presentation, I just wanted to say that um, uh, we have made uh, an extra effort to share additional information on a number of uh, uh, additional area, including uh, separate uh, unit economics for beauty and fashion, as well as our new business growth, as well as some additional information on uh, uh, new businesses, I mean, on businesses like uh, physical retail and others. So I hope uh, that enables uh, better understanding of our business for each of you. And some of the uh, KPIs that we normally share have also been shared, and there are a few more KPIs which probably will be shared on an annual basis. So with that, I'll start with um, with the fact that we do believe that it's been a strong performance through the year with our GMV growth at 71%, which is a year-on-year growth of, uh, uh, which has taken our GMV to 6,933 crores. Uh, and uh, our revenue growth has been 55% at 3,774 crores. Uh, gross, I, I want to point out once again that <coughs> our business um, uh, in, in, in beauty business, so we are inventory led and hence we book uh, revenue, uh, sales. Whereas in case of fashion, we are a market based business and we only book our commission income. And uh, it was this need for differential accounting that we saw that we need to share additional information, which we see, we've shared and we'll see it later. As far as gross profit is concerned, our gross profit is at 1,644 crores, which is a 73% year on year growth. And our gross margins have come out at 43.6%, which is a very healthy growth uh, gross margin for the consolidated firm. On the EBITDA side, uh, our EBITDA has come out at 163 crores, just about a 4% growth year on year. And the margins are at 4.3%. We believe that there are three big reasons for this. One is accelerated customer acquisition leading to higher marketing costs, some adversity on fulfillment costs during the year, uh, and we've had strategies to, to counter that, and I'll talk later about those. And also emerging mix uh, where we are investing in new businesses, where fashion, we have clearly made an investment, as well as in our new businesses of the Superstore and uh, Nika Man. And I think that's also clearly spelled out in later slides. So instead of talking about it here, I'll come to it then. On the PAT side, our PAT came out at just uh, 41 crores. Uh, almost 33% degrowth, however, and the margins is at 1.1. But this is also reflective of the fact that we have now accelerated uh, store rollout uh, with uh, and also warehouse rollout with its associated uh, hit in terms of depreciation and am- amortization. Next. Uh, this all, uh, we believe that this is a great uh, performance in, 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 in the midst of macro challenges like rising inflation reduction in discretionary spend by the consumers, as well as COVID uncertainty. There were two rounds of COVID uncertainty, first being in April, May, June. All of you are aware that uh, the Delta variant was very, very adverse, and there were lots of fears, and India suffered. And NICA continued to do business in that adverse condition. There were impact on supply chain as well as warehouse network and further rollout of our warehouses during that period, affecting some amount of um, fulfillment costs in the beginning part of the year. Um, similarly, in, in January, again, there were COVID fears for Omicron and a lot of celebratory uh, uh, weddings and many other things were canceled, leading to, again, some amount of demand, uh, subdued demand in that quarter. Uh, rising inflation is affecting to a certain extent uh, and uh, consumer companies are passing on higher prices to the consumer. Uh, we do believe that there is some impact of rising inflation and reduction con- discretionary spend. Uh, in consumer discretionary spend in our categories also. However, we do, uh, we feel that we've come out with strong result in spite of that. Uh, this is a very big point that NICA is pursuing diversification to address larger total addressable market 
If you look at our business in 2019, uh, we had 98% of the business coming from beauty uh, and uh, our, our uh, GMV was one, uh, 1,650 crores. We have grown it since then to almost 6,933 crores. And uh, total addressable market has also grown. Our uh, growth has accelerated to 71% year on year. Uh, This has been achieved through uh, fashion, which now accounts for 25% of our GMB. And now we are doing a similar uh, growth ambition by introducing um, our superstore business as well as uh, Nika Man. If we go to the next uh, slide, I will talk a little bit about this diversification strategy. So like you can see that in beauty, we are going deeper. Beauty TAM, likely TAM in 2025 is $28 billion. Uh, composition is not just dot com, but also um, uh, organized uh, retail will also grow from 19% to 30 to 35%. And towards that, our answer is through our own store rollout, where Nika retail stores under three formats are uh, servicing and catering. And we are, again, expanding our network. And we've also entered GTMT distribution space, though it will grow or uh, degrow from 72% to 41, 50% of the market, but it is still a large business. And to that effect, we have entered into Superstore, which is selling, which is allowing our brand partners to sell their brands to GTMT network throughout the country. And uh, this, uh, we'll talk more about this later. On the fashion side, uh, entering fashion market was addressing a larger TAM. And we, of course, started with dot-com business, which will address almost 22, 27% of the market going forward. So even if we have a small market share, it will be a substantial business. And we have only one store on Nika fashion side right now, but we will be going into some amount of physical retail with the right format that makes sense. Um, at the moment, we are not considering the GTMT business on the fashion side, except for some individual brands like Naked. Next. So this has led to a very strong growth in merchant uh, uh, on uh, GMV. And like you can see, our consolidated GMV came out at 71%, highest in last three years. And CAGR is also 61%. On the beauty side, um, our uh, GMV has grown 49% this year. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and we do believe that uh, fashion GMV, which grew at 168%, allowed us to do, deliver superior growth. So we are scaling very well in a highly competitive category like fashion. In beauty also, we do believe we are strengthening market share uh, because this is a very healthy growth in GMV in the beauty business. And on a consolidated business through diversification, we are accelerating our growth. Others include the new business verticals where we are now at 183 crores of GMV, but these will grow going forward. You can see that on a small base, these are businesses are growing rapidly. Uh, Coming to our key growth strategy, I think you have to say our number one growth strategy has been driving customer acquisition and retention across the funnel journey. And I'll come in into the details of those. So here you can see that um, we continue to grow our app downloads, which are now for beauty alone, they are at 47.3 million app downloads in aggregate. On the visit side, again, we have accelerated the visits. Uh, and uh, they have grown at about 34% on a year-on-year basis. Our monthly active users have grown very nicely to almost 20.8 um, at uh, 20.8 uh, million monthly active users on beauty alone, a huge growth of 54% from the previous year. And number of orders have also grown to 58% year-on-year uh, from a year ago. I think uh, just we'll comment on 2020 to 21, the number of orders grew small, like you can see hardly any growth. And a lot of investors asked me for that. But I think at that point, Nika took a conscious decision uh, to make our shipping policy and our minimum order policy stringent because in a COVID impacted year where we wanted to conserve both our expenses as well as our uh, physical uh, warehouse capacities were limited. We took a conscious call to not allow marginal low price, low uh, AOV orders. However, that does have some impact on customer acquisition and now our uh, our shipping policies are back to normal levels, pre-COVID levels. On the new customer acquisition, I think that has accelerated in beauty where we uh, had a 4.4 million new customers acquired. Over uh, This is a 49% growth over last year. Our trailing 12-month customer numbers have also grown 
uh, by a similar 49%. It's now stands at 8.4 million customers have bought on NICA platform over last 12 months. Uh, on the AOV side, there's a slight dip because of the shipping policy now going back. We obviously had huge gains during COVID time, like you can see, where our AOV had gone up by 36%. We have tried to maintain most of that gain, and in spite of lenient shipping policy, it's just come down slightly. And our existing and new customer mix, and this is not a new versus repeat, but it's a new customers, are all customers acquired within a year. They have accounted for 27% of our GMV share in, in beauty business with 73% coming from pre-existing customers. If we go back or further, I mean, go further to fashion business, uh, your app downloads are now at 25 million uh, lifetime app downloads, up from 10.9 million a year ago. And visits are up 156% to 441 million visits. And monthly active users stand at 15.3 million versus 5.8 million a year ago. Again, a very healthy growth. All of that resulting in order growth of 120% uh, from 2.4 million to 5.2 million. Moving forward, on the new customers, we acquired 1.6 million new customers in fashion uh, compared to 0.6 million last year. And the trailing 12-month customers now stand at a healthy 1.8 million against 0.6 million last year. Again, growth of 182%. AOV in fashion continues to improve. Uh, even on a high base, and all of you know that this is far higher than the competitive competitors' AOVs. Even in beauty, our AOVs are higher than the industry AOVs. And on existing and new customer mix, 74% of the business GMV came from new customers, with 26% coming from existing customers. Next. We also um, wanted to uh, develop deep relationship with diverse set of domestic and international brands. May I request Anchit to come in on this? Or I'll just take it for now. So we have more than 3,000 brand partners on the beauty side. And uh, we, are, we are continuing to bring international brands into the country. We have introduced more than 22 global brands through our in, uh, imports uh, business and more come through other distributors and retailers. Uh, we are also very um, focused on uh, what we call as ESG strategies, and we now have a conscious at NICA uh, catalog. Uh, uh, you know, we have a conscious at NICA uh, curation on the website where uh, conscious products which are classified into whether they are, uh, uh, you know, whether, whether, whether they're nasties free or whether they are, uh, uh, you know, animal, uh, not tested on animals, and a number of those strategies are being reflected on each of the products. So there is this conscious at NICA tag on, on all our brands and, uh, and their SKUs. Uh, we also are helping customers discover new niche brands through hidden gems, as well as through Beauty Bazaar. We are helping them discover made in India brands. And what is interesting on the right hand side is that our GMB mix has been very healthy. And each of our categories growing very nicely. So makeup, which is our biggest category, is also grown by 40% year on year. Skin is grown by 50% year on year. It's become a very large category, sometimes at par with makeup. And on the hair side, we are growing at 60% year on year, including bringing professional offering to the customers. And many other categories like fragrance, mom and baby, health and wellness and appliance, which we cater, uh, we, which we, uh, we add together, they have grown by 80% year on year. Uh, with that, I think on the beauty, on the fashion side, may I request Advaita to uh, come in on the sort now? Yeah, perfect. I'll jump in. So, uh, you know, folks, it's been about three years of really trying to build this business. A large part of our strategy over the last two years has been a very aggressive brand onboarding, making sure that we have the absolute best assortment for our customers. So we continued with that momentum of aggressive brand onboarding last year. Um, you know, I think another big pillar for the fashion business remains curation. That is one of our big differentiators. So we launched a couple of different properties that helps us bring very interesting pro uh, pegs to the customer. Things like Hidden Gems, where we travel the country to get, you know, very interesting, unique brands to the customers. A huge emphasis on sustainability and responsible fashion and also plus size fashion. The table on the right uh, just gives you a sense of the sheer size and scale of the catalog. That is one of the differences between fashion and beauty. There's just a lot of products and style out there that is, you know, proliferates across a whole bunch of uh, brands and subcategories. Um, a big decision we took this past year was beyond women, can we also have a play in men, kids, and home, all divisions that we ramped up this past year. 
And today we see that those new divisions, as we call emerging divisions in, uh, within our teams, is growing uh, very fast, much faster than the women's business. And so while women's remains a majority, uh, we're pretty confident that these will be good growth levels in the future. That is men, kids, and home. Moving on. Uh, so I think uh, going on the theme of penetrating uh, through the value chain, I think we are expanding our uh, physical uh, store network. This is just an image of our, one of our stores. And here you can see that NICA has uh, expanded the physical store network to 105 stores by the end of uh, March 2022. And these are in 49 cities. Our physical retail has grown at 72% GMV year on year. And uh, the GMV share of physical retail has ended at 7.5% in the quarter four of 22, 2022. Full year is still at 6.6 because, like I pointed out, there were many factors that impacted the uh, physical store performance in the first half of the year, uh, mainly COVID-related. Uh, we've also, for the first time, shared our GMV per square feet in our stores, which is, runs at 3,442 rupees per square feet per month. And the average size of our stores is about 940 square feet uh, per store. Uh, the second strategy has been to continue to expand our fulfillment centers. Uh, we had, uh, we now have 23 warehouses in 11 cities with 8.2 lakh square feet of capacity. We have added almost 2.4 lakh square feet in financial year 22, which is about 40% year on year growth. Uh, this regional warehouse capacity expansion is the strategy which will help us save um, fulfillment costs through uh, savings in air shipment rate, as well as, uh, you know, faster order to delivery for the customer resulting in, you know, better uh, customer experience. And we are now able to service almost 98% of PIN codes in the country and almost 95% of orders are delivered within five days. And in fact, in Metro and other areas, a uh, lot of orders are delivered within 48 hours also. Next. I think this is about uh, our superstore business, which we launched about six months ago. I think here we are trying to be vertically focused on beauty and personal care and wellness brands, where we are trying to play a distributor and a wholesaler role, uh, selling these products to retailers uh, with the margins that is passed on to them. And here we are trying to serve underserved retailers like beauty stores, pharmacy salons and Kirana stores, more premium Kirana stores. Um, we already have about 18,800 transacting retailers on this platform by the end of quarter four in 302 cities, and the number of brands listed are 134. I would say that these are very early days. We've just launched it, and the platform seems to be doing well and lies a growth, a long journey ahead uh, as the addressable cam is very large. Uh, I think all of you are aware that NICA has believed in creating, acquiring, and scaling a portfolio of independent and new age consumer first brands. Uh, in makeup, you know that NICA has a number of uh, uh, own brands that we were launched over the last five years, six years, beginning with NICA Cosmetics, later K Beauty, which is our first celebrity beauty brand. Uh, on the skincare side, we now have a derma based skincare brand called NICA Skin RX as well as a Korean beauty brand called Nika Skin Secret. And on the hair care side, we are, under Nika Natural, we have an extensive hair care range. Going to the next page, we also have a Wanderlust range, which is our bath and body range. And we've gone in for acquisition of three businesses on the beauty side. One is a dot and key where we now own 51%. It's a premium skincare brand and with very specific solution uh, for customers. Uh, we have also invested in a sustainable skincare and personal care brand called Earth Rhythm. Uh, we have a smaller share here, and we are uh, jointly promoting a nutraceutical beauty brand called Nudge, uh, which is towards superfoods. Uh, this is in 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 uh, with a uh, with a company called. Uh, uh, this is with a partner. On the uh, these brands, our own brands account for more than 10% of GMV of uh, uh, BP's beauty and personal care business on the. Uh, in, in the year, financial year 22. Uh, this doesn't include the acquired brands, just the own brands. This is the first time we are sharing this number. On the fashion side, uh, we have a number of brands, uh, uh, like we have a brand called 20 Dresses, which was a, acquired a while ago, and we have scaled it up. Uh, RSVP has been apparel, footwear, and bags brand that has launched uh, uh, an evening wear label. 
Naked is also an in-house uh, brand uh, for lingerie and athleisure. And uh, we had acquired earlier a jewelry and accessory brand called Pippa Bella. And then Indian wear brand Gajra Gang was launched last year. Uh, or again, fashion uh, GMV from our own brand is now at about 7%. Uh, yeah, this con- the list continues with Likha for curated Indian wear, a bag and footwear brand called Ikik, uh, which has had a good acceptance. And we recently acquired a brand called Kika, which is a premium women's active wear. So we are not uh, going uh, and acquiring any any brand, but I think we have a clear strategy towards the market gaps and uh, and the um, uh, and and a brand perspective that we'd like to fill. And it's those brands that we have gone ahead and acquired or created ourselves. Next. I think we are also very focused on new ways of selling and holistic consumer connect. Uh, you are aware of number of TV campaigns that were done last year uh, to uh, to again uh, bring larger number of customers through upper funnel marketing. Uh, we also continue to do tech implementation of virtual makeover tools like L'Oreal's virtual tool that was uh, uh, that was integrated on Nika platform, as well as live streaming is very much part of the Nika platform. And on the content side, all of you are aware that we have more than 13 million social media followers through number of handles, both on Instagram as well as YouTube and Facebook. Uh, we also have a very large influencer network and connect, uh, and we have a network uh, to pay them on uh, for the contribution of the business to Nike platform. And we have another explore uh, watch and buy feature uh, where customers can watch the videos and and based on the education they can buy. So there has been a number of new ways of selling that has been introduced by Nike. And then I would like to request Arvind to take on the financial performance slides. Uh, thank you, Falguni. So I'll talk about the financial performance and uh, I'll first talk about the full year performance. Uh, talking about revenue, uh, you can see that in FY22, we have reported revenue of 3,773 crore, which is a growth of 55% year over year. And in fact, uh, this is the uh, fastest growth in last three years, despite uh, two COVID waves. So it's quite uh, impressive and you know strong growth momentum. And if you look at three-year Kegel, it is uh, at uh, 48%. Uh, added to that, if you look at gross uh, profit chart, in fact, the growth in gross profit is even higher than revenue growth. Uh, it's about 73% in terms of absolute to absolute growth. Uh, and the margins has actually improved from 38.9% to 43.6%, uh, close to four bips improvement. Part of it uh, is a uh, improvement because uh, B2B revenue, which is advertisement has scaled very well this year versus last year. And also because own brand share has bounced back to pre-COVID level. But also part of it is also mix effect uh, because of fashion, which is reported differently. Talking about EBITDA, uh, we have reported EBITDA of uh, 163 crore uh, FY22, which is a margin of 4.3%. Uh, and you know it appears that EBITDA is kind of flat or just 4% growth in terms of absolute number. And uh, it appears that uh, EBITDA margin have dipped by almost 200 bips. But let me explain you the levers uh, in terms of investments that we have made this year. Uh, and Palguni spoke about some of them. So in terms of non-linear growth initiative, we continue to invest into fashion, which is scaling very well. But we have also started investing into new initiatives such as Superstore by Nika and Nika Men and International. I have a slide to give you some breakouts, which we are uh, sharing for the first time. Uh, so that's that's one reason that some of our internal accruals generated out of beauty verticals have been invested into these non-linear growth initiatives. Added to that, we have also accelerated our uh, uh, new customer acquisition, uh, which which is also supported by uh, higher investment into marketing, uh, which is again uh, uh, you know impacting our EBITDA. And the third one is. We have also expanded our fulfillment capacity uh, and moved uh, closer to customer. So some of these are ahead of the curve investment. In fact, we have also started expanding into physical retail. Last year, it was 
uh, kind of a muted expansion that we had done due to COVID disruption. So all these investments are funded out of internal accruals, which is why at a blended level, EBITDA margin have dipped to 4.3%. Uh, talking about the PET number, we have reported uh, 41.3 crore of profit after tax this year, which is 1.1% of the revenue. Uh, again, the impact of EBITDA dip of 200 bips uh, is partly offset by uh, better leverage on uh, financing cost and also on depreciation and amortization. So net dip in uh, pet margin is about 140 bips versus 200 bips uh, in EBITDA. I have a slide which, which I want to take you next, uh, which is to talk about these verticals. And uh, as you can see here, we have given the breakup of three verticals here, BPC, which is our largest business, uh, fashion, uh, which is already scaling up very well, and others. And others here comprises of uh, uh, new initiatives such as uh, Superstore, which is the EB2B vertical, and Nika Men, and some initial investment into international. So these new initiatives are all bucketed under others as they scale up. Uh, we might separate them as well over time, but as of now, they are bucketed under others. So if you look at this chart, in terms of GMV, we have grown 71% year over year, uh, which is quite healthy growth in, in a year which was disrupted by COVID. Uh, if you look at uh, revenue from operation, I already spoke about it. We grew 55% year over year. In terms of gross profit, uh, we grew 73% year over year at a blended level. And the margins have improved uh, from 38.9% to 43.6%. Part of it is also mixed effect uh, due to fashion growing faster than BPC uh, because it is reported uh, as a, uh, on a marketplace uh, model, it is report, margins are reported as revenue. So the reporting uh, framework is a bit different. So there is a mixed effect in that. Uh, if I talk about EBITDA, uh, and I wanted to invite attention here to the breakup uh, of EBITDA numbers. If you look at beauty as a vertical, the EBITDA margins are 8.2%, which is quite similar to last year. Last year it was 8.3% as a percentage to revenue. Uh, so it's kind of flat, despite making heavy investments into marketing to accelerate the customer acquisition, and despite making uh, uh, significant expansion into fulfillment network, uh, which in the short term uh, brings more uh, same, more cost to the PNL, but the benefit of uh, freight cost coming down gets realized over time. So despite that, beauty has maintained its habit at 8.2 percent. And uh, in terms of fashion, uh, you know, because it is reported differently, we have also given a different metric here, which you can see at the bottom. Um, and that's that's uh, NSV, net sales value, uh, because net sales value is uh, net of uh, returns, taxation, and cancellation. And at that level, it becomes quite comparable to BPC. Uh, so if you look at the gross margin for fashion, it is about 44.6%, similar to BPC. And in terms of fulfillment cost, it is 11% versus 106 in BPC. If you look at marketing cost, that's significantly higher versus BPC because fashion is obviously is an early stage of uh, building the business and the ratio of new customer uh, contribution to uh, GMV is much higher than the repeat customer. And uh, we, we did acquire uh, 1.6 million customers this year. And in terms of uh, employee benefit expense, uh, I also want to uh, highlight that if you look at BPC, the employee benefit expense is 8% uh, versus 9.2% last year. So there is already an operating leverage which is playing favorably here. If you look at fashion, it is 11.3%. Uh, and again, that will get uh, scale over time and start playing as operating leverage. And if you look at others, which are new verticals, they are really a kind of a seed investment this year. So obviously the ratio of employee cost is much higher than uh, versus the revenue and NSV. So the net, the impact of investment into fashion and other segments, incrementally we have invested almost 80 crore from our internal approvals, which shows up 
uh, as a as a call, uh, in the blended numbers uh, it shows up almost 200 bips kind of investment and therefore our ebitda has come down as a margin percentage from 6.4 to 4.3 moving on this is just to uh, show the long term trend and why we feel so confident about continue to invest into fashion uh, which is already scaling very well in a very hyper uh, competitive market uh, it was launched in fy19 but it started scaling up post covid and we see that fashion has reached to the same scale as uh, beauty uh, in four years versus let's say bp series to same scale uh, in five years so it's it's really building up well moving on i also wanted to give a color on marketing cost uh, a bit and there are two charts here bpc and fashion uh, if we look at um, cost as a percentage to nsv which is the net sales value uh, in case of uh, bpc it is at 9.5% fy22 last year was actually an aberration and we spent only 5.9% to nsv ratio uh, that was because in h1 we were quite conservative in uh, spending marketing money uh, due to covid environment uh, and if you look at the increase in new customer acquisition versus last year from 3 million to 4.4 million so almost 49% increase in new customer acquisition and if you look at as a long term trajectory uh, marketing cost as a percentage to nsv is actually quite better versus fy19 uh, 13.7 versus 9.5 and that goes back to the chart that falguni explained earlier that 73% of our business in bpc Uh, comes from existing customer so while we continue to acquire many new customers but our cohort is quite healthy and can, you know over time we get a leverage in marketing cost so versus 55% share of uh, repeat customers in fy19 we are at 73% in fy22 and that shows up in marketing cost as a percentage to nsv as a leverage uh, but if you look at fashion chart uh, this is scaling up last two years and this year we acquired 1.6 million customer versus 0.6 million customer last year which is a 157% growth and in terms of marketing spend uh, we have consciously stepped up uh, spends and uh, it is at 27.4% to nsv ratio uh, and that also obviously has a mix impact in our overall uh, marketing cost to revenue and marketing cost to nsv ratios as well but these are conscious choices uh, looking at the future uh, growth prospects in this uh, large categories and large ten moving on this is summary of our results uh, i already talked about uh, annual results so i will probably uh, talk about quarterly results here so in this quarter we have reported revenue of 973 crore uh, which is year over year growth of 31% although sequentially it is lower by 11% versus quarter 3 uh, but that was expected because quarter 3 is seasonally the best quarter and peak uh, quarter in terms of sales because of festive season and it was also free from any covid disruption uh, versus this quarter when in january due to omicron there was some impact on sales especially in physical retail stores uh, so 31% growth there but we believe that we have grown ahead of the uh market and we are uh, strengthening our market share uh in terms of gross margin uh, we have reported 43.7% gross margin for this quarter uh, which is better by 254 bips versus last year same quarter although it is lower by 263 bips previous quarter sequentially uh, which again uh, is a seasonality last quarter was benefited due to higher advertisement income from brands because brand do spend aggressively in quarter 3 from their marketing budget so we got benefited out of that and talking about ebitda margin uh, we have reported 4% ebitda this quarter which is 200 bips lower than last year uh, due to the investments that i already talked about in terms of fulfillment in terms of customer acquisition and some of the uh, percentage cost uh, is shown in the table below uh, so those are the trends uh, which we already spoke about but i also wanted to highlight that in terms of fulfillment cost 
and marketing cost versus previous quarter. Uh, you can see that uh, versus 10.6 percent uh, last quarter, we have spent 9.7 percent on fulfillment cost. So the benefit of uh, expansion of uh, uh, warehousing capacity uh, regionally has started playing in terms of lower freight cost, uh, and that shows up in these numbers. So that's a healthy trend. And in terms of marketing, also it has come down from 13.7 to 12 percent because we did spend on brand building last quarter, and it was also a sale quarter. So obviously marketing spends were at much higher level. So it has come down to 12 percent. Employee expense though has gone up as a percentage from 8.5 percent to 9.3 percent, but that's more a leverage, uh, deleverage because of lower scale of revenue. If you compare the absolute cost, uh, it is at 90.8 crore versus 93.3 crore last quarter. So no major change in terms of uh, this fixed cost aspect. So that's on uh, financials uh, in terms of PNL. I can quickly talk about uh, balance sheet. Uh, in terms of uh, non-current assets, uh, we have made investments in uh, expanding physical stores and fulfillment centers. So that shows up in our PPE line. Uh, there are also in, there is also impact on ROU assets because of the lease uh, liability as well as assets that come in the balance sheet uh, due to long-term nature of these leases. We also did investment uh, in dot and key. We acquired 51% stake, stake, so that shows in goodwill, and part of it is also sitting in other tangible asset in form of brand value. And uh, uh, deferred tax asset is a function of uh, uh, losses in Nike fashion, and uh, we believe that we can uh, offset these losses against future profits. So we have recognized deferred tax asset, and it's a continuing position which we had last year as well. In terms of current assets, uh, you can see the investment is almost double of last year. But it's primarily coming from inventories, uh, which is a function of natural business growth, uh, as well as uh, we also built up uh, longer inventory uh, to offset some of the supply chain disruptions that we are seeing. So it was a strategic call. Uh, we believe we are at a healthy level of inventory with 66 days versus 71 days last year. And uh, overall, uh, other part of the current assets is cash, uh, increase in cash balance. So we are at almost 704 crore of cash in the balance sheet, uh, which is uh, benefited from uh, primary in the IPO, as well as some pre IPO placement we had done. Talking about the equities, uh, you know, our network base has gone up from 490 crore to 1345 crore. And in terms of non-current and uh, current liabilities. There are no uh, major movements, uh, except that borrowings, bank borrowings have gone up from 185 crore to 332 crore. Uh, that's, that, is, that is in tandem with working capital investment that we have done. Uh, and I have a cash flow to explain how we have funded the increase in current assets. But uh, we, we, are, we are good on receivables, tables, and overall working capital cycle is maintained at last year level. Let's move. In terms of cash flow, uh, I want to highlight the line called operating profit before working capital changes. So which is at 183 crore, uh, which is almost similar to last year in terms of absolute value. And that is despite making investment into growth verticals, which I spoke earlier, that there is almost 80 crore incremental investment into fashion and new businesses put together. Uh, and despite that, we have uh, generated same amount of operating cash flow before working capital. Of course, we have made a higher investment to working capital, uh, which I explained earlier as part of the balance sheet explanation. So we are paying our uh, suppliers faster, but we are also securing inventories so that we don't face any supply chain disruptions and there's no out, out of stock. Uh, we, due to that, uh, inventory investments have gone up uh, during this period. And talking about investing activity, uh, uh, because of investment into stores and warehouses, we have invested 94 crore versus 42 crore last year. So that's more than double of investment. And rest of uh, the cash flow is more a representation thing. Uh, we have cash balance of 705 crore, which is shown in different lines due to the maturity period. So we have some deposits which are longer than 12 months. So that those are shown in 
uh, investment in fixed deposits, but we also have some short-term deposits. Uh, and we are at a healthy cash balance of 705 crore. Moving on. So this was my last slide. Uh, maybe I relate back to Falguni for Q&A. Yeah, so just to summarize, uh, really, uh, we do feel that uh, uh, we've uh, really uh, worked hard to deliver good results, which are a balance between long-term growth and uh, a good eye on our unit cost economics for each of the new businesses that we are building so that eventually there is path to profitability in each of the business. This is being done while supporting and maintaining our profitability on the main beauty business, the larger business. And uh, But yes, we are uh, clearly investing in customer acquisition. We are uh, investing in uh, new business initiatives and we are investing in greater fulfillment capacity going closer to our customers. Uh, so that we are more future ready in terms of, uh, you know, our uh, customer promise on delivery. So this has been the big trend. Uh, and these results have to be seen in light of slight adversity in the environment. Clearly, we had two waves of COVID during the year. And they have impacted to a certain extent, uh, whether our physical retail business or taken slightly off the table in certain segments of our beauty business or fashion business. So, I think overall, we do believe that uh, companies worked hard to respect and uh, deliver to the investor capital, and uh, we will continue to do uh, the same approach going forward. Uh, thank you, Falgiri. Uh, we'll now open it up to Q&A. Uh, anyone who has a question, please uh, raise your hand, and we'll take your question in order. Uh, please limit yourself to maximum two questions so we can accommodate as many people as possible. Uh, operator, can we unmute the line of uh, Sachin Salgaonkar from uh, Bofa first? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Falguni and team, thanks a lot for you know those incremental this, uh, closures. You know, definitely helps. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first question, just wanted to understand 4Q. Apart from seasonality and Omicron, did we face any impact uh, from, let's say, higher inflation and, you know, uh, related issues? And of course, uh, the same question is on going ahead, which is uh, rising inflation at some level has an impact on discretionary spends, as well as has an impact on costs, especially the fuel cost impacting, uh, you know, the delivery charges. So just want to understand how you guys look at it. So I'll take that question. Uh, to be honest, you know, one, uh, uh, I mean, this whole two years of COVID has been very, very difficult to really re- read into the trends. And if I may say so, uh, April, uh, May, June of 2000, uh, uh, you know, 2021 uh, was, uh, uh, sorry, 2020 was massively affected where we could only do uh, essentials, only business. And as a result, the first quarter of um, April, May, June uh, 2021 uh, uh, was very, very strong on growth. You know, you can see that in our quarter on quarter growth, very strong growth. Um, even though that, uh, you know, the strong uh, strength in growth, uh, it came a uh, little bit differently for different sectors. You know, skin care grows at a certain point in time, personal pro- care grows at a certain point in time. And then suddenly, you know, stores open up and you see a huge revival in makeup demand. So to be honest, even if for someone who's watching for year-on-year growth trends, quarter-on-quarter, not I see quarter-on-quarter is not the right way to look at it because our business clearly has uh, seasonality. Uh, But year-on-year numbers for a similar quarter also, exact comparisons are not available. But what we've done in this deck is we've told you that I think companies working very hard to grow each of the categories. So while uh, makeup is our largest category, it has grown at 40% year-on-year. Skincare has grown 50% year on year. Haircare has grown 60% year on year. And all other categories have grown 80% year on year. So I think uh, companies definitely um, taking, uh, making an effort to continue to tap into the market opportunities and, and deliver on growth is what I would say. Is it easy? Um, uh, I, I, I don't know how to translate that because there are clearly periods of very strong demand that you can see. Uh, you know, in terms of even physical retail, I think uh, October to December quarter was quite strong from consumer demand perspective, but it was also strong from competitive activity perspective. And then you find that, yes, there are certain months when demand is strong and certain months when demand is not strong, even within the quarter. 
and sometimes the demand shifts from e-commerce to physical and physical to e-commerce. And similar trends in fashion, we had very, very strong growth in, in the first quarter of uh, last year. And uh, this uh, first quarter this year, um, uh, you know, first quarter of last year to this year was a very strong growth. And then there were a couple of quarters uh, where we felt that marketing costs were too high and we were trying to control our marketing costs uh, to a better level. So I wouldn't say it's easy. I wouldn't say that uh, things are very bad where we are not able to grow at all, uh, but it is a tricky environment. Uh, any thoughts on the discretionary spending? Uh, do you see that getting impacted for fashion and cosmetic? <clears throat> see, there is a certain amount of uh, you discretionary spending that comes in line with wedding season in both these categories. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, the wedding season came out very strong in the October to December quarter uh, because it was like uh, after two years, the weddings were picking up. And then suddenly the threat of Omicron came and a number of weddings which were being planned in, uh, uh, in um, uh, you know, from Jan to March uh, were either downsized or pushed out. Many of them downsized rather than pushed out and some pushed out to the summer season. So um, at the margin, if you say that is it impacted... Uh, uh, some amount of demand is definitely being impacted. Uh, if you ask, uh, you know, um, it, it's it's very variable, you know, for the highest income category, which many of the Nike customers are, there is not that much of a difference. Uh, but we also see big changes from category to category. Uh, but I wouldn't call it any of it is so adverse that you can't grow or you just don't uh, achieve the numbers. And but it's uh, it's it's very it's very variable, and there are periods of strong demand, and followed by periods of little bit weak demand. Thank you. Um, second question is on fashion, uh, both on uh, you know AOV and marketing spends. Your AOV Falcony is you know inching up every quarter, and it's almost uh, you know all-time high. So at some level, do you guys see a risk that you know it's turning out to be perhaps a niche high-end market for fashion? And the related question is, you know, on the comment what Arvin made, which is on marketing spends, there is a conscious effort to spend a bit high. Uh, globally, we are seeing most other country, uh, companies actually pulling back on, you know, selling and marketing discretionary spends. Just wanted to understand, you know, the outlook out here. So I can, uh, I can take, you know, the fashion question at least. Uh, so starting with that, in terms of AOV, um, you know, yes, I think we're, we're sort of pleased with the high AOV of 3200, which is, you know, far higher than what we see uh, in the market. Uh, there are a couple of things at play here. The first is, and, you know, something, um, the components of what we were selling is shifting. So you could say that clothing and apparel is becoming a lot larger as uh, as as a portion of sales. And in the early days of fashion, there was a lot more accessories and lingerie and sort of cheaper items that were selling. So it's not that the assortment is getting more premium. In fact, I feel that the assortment is getting more accessible. It's just that the types of products that are selling are skewing to, you know, higher average selling price products. Point number one. Point number two is we're definitely seeing basket sizes go up. Um, so that is, again, something that's affecting average order value. And that is the nature of, you know, just adding a lot more categories. So there's just a lot more for the customer to add to their cart. Uh, you also mentioned on marketing, you wanted some sort of insight. Uh, yes, the marketing numbers um, are appearing less efficient this year compared to last year. But again, last year was, um, you know, a COVID year where I, I do believe that the marketing numbers were not sort of representative of really what uh, the situation is um, now. And number two, I think, uh, you know, one thing is that this year we spent a lot on brand building. It's the first year we did TV commercials. It's the first year we did celebrities. So a lot of that is baked into the marketing numbers that you see, which wouldn't be comparable year on year as well. Yeah, going ahead also, there is an inclination to spend more on marketing? Um, you know, I think we're very focused on driving fashion to a profitable state. Uh, there is, you know, strong profitability DNA here. And so what I'm really focused on is uh, really nailing that dynamic between growth and profitability. And I do feel, uh, you know, that we remain focused on getting to that right mix of growth and profitability. I'd like to come in on, on the marketing costs. You know, what I find is that uh, uh, the, uh, if, if you acquire the right customer, uh, very often in beauty, again, you know, uh, we break even on the second order and typical customer buys three to four orders in, in a year. So I think as far as you're doing marketing at an efficiency efficient scale, which I think on beauty we are clearly doing, then I feel that there is a certain uh, certain customer acquisition strategy we want to follow. 
uh, because Nike has never chased uh, just customer uh, acquisition for sake of customer acquisition. But at the same time, uh, you know, we are at a very early growth stage where Nike may have only like around, uh, you know, 15 million customers who may have ever bought on beauty, whereas the size of e-commerce customer base is larger. So in a very prudent manner, we want to continue doing customer acquisition, but in a a creative manner with a big focus on uh, long-term value of those customers that we are acquiring. In fashion, we are a little bit at an early stage of growth where the mix of repeat to, uh, you know, new customer to repeat customer ratios are still low and they will pan out over time. The fashion as a platform will grow much wider. I think our width of platform is um, like if you see beauty itself is 3,000 3, plus brands, whereas fashion is still at 1,500 brands. So we do believe that fashion has more growing to do in terms of bringing additional brands and categories online, and there's more work to do. And as we do that, uh, but in fashion, a lot of uh, customer visits are already coming in, a lot of customer downloads are happening. And uh, through the funnel, we need to convert more through a wider catalog and, uh, you know, wider catalog. So that is clearly going to happen. Uh, in general, Nike believes in premiumization, both for beauty and fashion. And we don't see any desire and need to rush to the bottom in uh, in terms of acquiring the, uh, the, 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 the lowest rung customers. So I think we'll be selective and we will uh, look at the long-term value of the customers that we acquire. And, and, and it will be a balance between long-term growth and uh, short-term profitability objectives. Thank you. Uh, we'll we, take have, the we have next yeah. question from Percy. So, Yeah, please go ahead. Percy, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, my, my first question is on uh, the BPC margins. And uh, thank you very much for giving this uh, clarity on segmental margins. Uh, uh, that's a really good disclosure that you've done. So uh, my question is this. See, most of the street uh, is expecting BPC margins in the long term to trend anywhere between 15 to 20 percent. Now, I don't expect you to comment on whether this is a reasonable expectation or not. But in light of this expectation, my question is, where do you see uh, leverage for margin expansion in BPC? I mean, given your main costs of ad spend, uh, uh, fulfillment, etc. I'm assuming that at a 44 percent gross profit to NSV ratio, you're fairly uh, uh, settled or fa- fairly uh, doing fairly well there. And I'm, I would assume there would not be a huge leverage there. So what are the other costs uh, in terms of fulfillment, marketing, etc., your main cost, employee costs? How much further over a, a really longer period of horizon do you think uh, these costs can go? So if I may come in, I think on the gross profit margin itself, uh, it can increase from this percentage because of uh, ad income and Nike can be a big platform with the number of visits and how valuable those visits are from a beauty and personal care customer perspective. You know, if you want to, you can, um, any brand can acquire a lot of new customers on our platform. And uh, for doing that, they may continue to uh, spend on marketing on our platform. And we also have five customers on an average has four and a half, five items in a cart, which means that we can deliver new customer acquisition to brands, uh, which is much higher than the new customer acquisition at the firm level. Uh, so that is, so I do believe that I'm not saying we would definitely do that, but to assume that there won't be any improvement in gross profit margin, I do not agree. There is generally a large proliferation in brands in beauty and personal care, like globally also. And that in a way gives power to the platforms and and retailers where brands need the platform and retailers to build their brands. Uh, on fulfillment costs, yes, they can go down slightly, but yes, a lot of gain is already there. It can't go down much more than 50 to 100 basis points. Uh, and marketing and fulfillment costs in the long run for a very mature platform can be again lower, but it's already uh, running at about 9.5%. But you can see that in a COVID impacted year, it had come down for us as, as low as 5.9. But then that year, we did not grow that much new customer. We didn't acquire too many new customers. It was the customer acquisition was 3 million, which was at a similar level as previous year. But this year, we've accelerated customer acquisition. So marketing and advertising is a truly variable cost. And it depends on our objectives of customer acquisition, 
and uh, also some amount of money we also have to spend on bringing back the returning customers and on employee benefit of course with the uh, size and scale there will continue to be some benefit so i think long term ebitda margin most investors believe can be higher in this business uh, in in the multi brand uh, specialty beauty retail business uh, long term ebitda ebitda margins can be higher than the current levels do you want to hear about fashion and other consolidated also there the long and short is that we believe in having the right unit cost economics or unit unit cost met, metric for each business currently fashion is at uh, 11.9% negative ebitda margin most of it due to marketing and advertisement expense which we believe that being almost third year of our scale up fourth year since launch for fashion business there is some more ground to cover before our a uh, repeat and new customer ratio emerge in an area where we can control our marketing and advertising costs at a better level because the market is very large and we have ground to cover in acquiring and converting the customer visits uh, we will continue to do that but in a in a in a very mindful way so that we can uh, we we over time uh, become positive on our i mean break even on our bidda margin right and i think one thing to just add there and you know ankit if you can hover over the gross profit margin on nsv uh which is apples to apples for you know beauty and fashion in terms of a base you can see that the gross margin per, uh, percentage is looking fairly similar across both businesses uh and that too at a very early stage in the lifetime of of the fashion journey and other other businesses which is mainly nika man and uh, b e b to b business they are very new nika man is about a year and a half old and e b to b business is not even 6 months old so we will uh, continue to invest in those businesses and that's why we have started giving segmental not really segmental but we've started giving vertical focus uh, ebitda so that you can see that while the beauty business ebitda was 277 crores we've invested as much as 110 crores between fashion and our new businesses Right, and I think you know one thing that we were trying to hover on. It's the it's the last note on this slide, which is that the fashion contribution margin has been positive um, uh, this year. And uh, you know we calculate that really it's it's fully loaded with all the costs, fulfillment, marketing, selling expenses, uh, and under that you know we've got the employee costs and the indirect and and the overhead. So we've been um, you know able to achieve contribution profit positive for this year. So thank you for answering your questions and next yeah the next question is from the line of siddharth botra uh, operator can we unmute him yes siddharth can you please unmute yourself and siddharth can you please unmute yourself and ask your question siddharth botra uh maybe we'll take the next question uh from the line of kapil singh kapil can you unmute us hello can you hear me yes okay uh so i have two questions uh firstly um while you've been uh, largely solving for online users uh you are gradually now addressing the offline stores also where the opportunity potentially is higher uh how aggressive is the strategy going to be in the offline compared to online business so maybe maybe i'll i'll kick it off and then uh, others can add so i think uh, we've always been very uh, sure that omni channel retail is the only solution for a country like india and uh, that's why you can see that you know we've managed to grow our physical retail footprint uh quite significantly in the last 5 years and today we're sitting at 105 retail stores um and as we've shown this time for the first time uh you know we've disclosed what the gmv uh you know is uh in terms of gmv as a percent of the total uh gmv so the the online versus offline uh, split um so it goes to show you that our physical retail business is growing very well and uh, we see it as a massive opportunity as you said so the potential is there for us to expand the footprint continues continue to expand the footprint not only across a larger number of cities but also increase the constant concentration uh within uh, cities so it's a, it remains a large part of the strategy do i you know i think in terms of gmv share 
it will probably, uh, you know, the, the reality is online is a, is, a, is a very fast growing business. So the GMV share will always remain at this, you know, maybe single digits or, or low double digits, but uh, online will remain a majority of the business in large part because the two are not apples to apples comparison. Online, you've got 3,000 plus brands available, whereas in physical stores, only about 80 to 100 brands. So it's also not totally the right comparison. But otherwise, I think based on the metrics and the results that we're seeing, it's something that we will continue to expand uh, meaningfully in the coming years. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is on the Superstore. So can you uh, just talk about what exactly are you uh, looking to do? Uh, just a compare and contrast of the online BPC business versus Superstore. Is it something new that you're trying out or do you believe you already have a model which has right to win? Because, you know, you already cover 98% of the pin codes. So I'm just thinking aloud, what are we solving for here? And how the operating economics will be different, uh, you know, things like working capital, store marketing, etc. So I'll come in here. So if you look at the traditional, uh, 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 the traditional way, I mean, before going to the time, I just want to talk about the business. So if you look at the traditional distribution that FMCG companies used, uh, they would, the brand and manufacturers would sell their product to distributors and wholesalers who would onward sell it to retailer. Nika, uh, started selling directly to the consumer and, uh, basically started playing the role of distributor, wholesaler, come retailer. And that is direct to consumer model. What we do believe that, uh, you know, in spite of uh, e-commerce being quite large and growing, uh, I think, uh, the rest of the market will also continue. The physical, GTMT market will continue and NICA wants to backward integrate into uh, solving for supplying to these retailers. And we are, we have deep relationship with our brand and manufacturing manufacturers of FMCG companies uh, because we retail for them online. And now what we are doing is we are extending that as uh, this uh, GTMT distribution network that we have created that any brand can buy. And if you look at it traditionally, like the FMCG companies kept their distribution only in-house and Hindustan Lever or ITC or any of the brands like PNG would use their distribution network only for their brands. Now what Nika is doing is creating the GTMT distribution network, but it is available to any new brand, any growing brand, any international brand that wants to come into the country. So I do believe that we are serving a very special needs and many of these brands are picking up that, uh, you know, third party distribution network that is available. And uh, we are winning brands very quickly within us. You know, we just launched it six months ago and we already have 134 brands listed. And we are already uh, creating about presence in 302 cities. And we are transacting with almost 18, 19,000 retailers. This does need feet on street to get the retailers to sign up. And there is some amount of investment required. So Nika will do it right, uh, keeping the same unit economic metrics in mind. But of course, it falls into place over a couple of years. And um, initially, we would have to invest some amount of money in this business, but it will be, again, balanced with the view to short-term profitability and long-term growth objectives of this business. But I do uh, strongly believe that Nika has a right to win. We have a very interesting and excellent app, and we have great relationship with our brand partners who will give us a right to win in this segment. Thank you. Uh, Falgini, uh, just a quick question. We are almost at time. If it's okay with you to extend this by another maybe 15 minutes. Yeah, we, we could five do minutes. that. Yeah, we could do Great. that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Rajgopal Tampi. Uh, can you please unmute yourself uh, and ask your question? Thank you. Please limit. Rajgopal, can you please unmute yourself and go ahead? Um, Maybe we'll just take the next question from uh, Manisha Dukia from Goldman Sachs. Manish, please go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for taking my questions. Uh, my first question is, if you can just help us understand what's happening uh, in the competitive landscape, uh, and this is across both uh, beauty and uh, fashion. Now, on beauty, we keep reading that some of the larger Indian conglomerates uh, are getting slightly more aggressive on the beauty side. So are you seeing any signs of that in your business at all or or given you know just the differentiation that you talk about there's really not any material impact and and same question on fashion as well i think when I mean, you look at the quarter and you called out there's definitely seasonality in your business but the fashion business gmv was flat quarter on quarter so is part of that also a function of the fact that competition potentially 
has been a lot more aggressive. I mean, we know that, for example, Reliance certainly has been very aggressive in the fashion side. Um, so are you seeing any impact of that on the growth as well? So we'd love to get your thoughts on, on both those verticals. Yeah, honestly, I think uh, I think many of you all are in a better position to judge competitive landscape than us. Uh, all I can say is that uh, uh, what we hear from our brand partners mostly uh, in terms of our role uh, relative to other competitors' role, we do hear that on the beauty side, many of the large partners continue to want to work with Nika because of the size and scale and the organized manner in which Nika works with them to deliver their numbers. And I can ask Sanchi to come in more on that. Anshit, would you like to come in? Yeah, sure. So again, I think uh, we can just share, you know, whatever we have, from whatever we hear from our partners and whatever we see uh, in, in the business day to day. So what I would say is that, look, we've always said the horizontals, like uh, the horizontal, the horizontal marketplaces have been around since, uh, you know, since 2012, 13. So they're not new. Uh, then you've got some of the direct to consumer uh, guys who who were, uh, you know, who I think made a big push earlier in the first half of this year, as well as some of the other smaller vertically specialized beauty retailers. Um, and I think what's happened is that there was a lot of noise, especially around November, December, when we were going public. I think a lot of uh, competitors used it as a time to relook at the beauty space uh, and to throw their hat into the ring. But uh, I would say that from what we're seeing on the ground, the competitive intensity seems to have reduced actually uh, since then. Uh, and um, you know, our hypothesis is that there is prob- there are probably larger markets for the larger horizontals to fight for. Uh, we believe, obviously, groceries, uh, electronics, fashion are larger addressable markets. And I think that's where a lot of the horizontals and some of the new entrants, as you mentioned, will probably focus their time and energy. And so there was, uh, there was some additional focus on beauty from the larger players in the interim, but that seems to have receded. Now, if some of the uh, local uh, uh, you know, companies that you mentioned do decide to get into beauty in a big way, like we've all seen in the news, I actually think it's going to be a good thing for the market. You know, till date, Nika has single-handedly built uh, the beauty uh, industry in India, uh, obviously with the support of our brand partners, but is the only retailer of, of size and scale in the market and, and a retailer focused on education and, and building awareness for beauty consumption. You know, we've built, we've helped build the market to where it is today. So it, you know, in our, in our point of view, some healthy competition, uh, and, and companies who are willing to invest in the Indian beauty ecosystem and help to grow the market could in fact have a positive, uh, impact on us. So that is, um, a short, uh, I guess a long, uh, long answer, but try to explain to you the, the different, uh, parts of the competitive spectrum. I think, um, Jumping in on fashion, uh, you know, the way I sort of look at it is first and foremost, just taking a step back, the massive size and opportunity of the fashion market. You're talking about a $125 billion uh, industry by 2025. You're talking about 25% online penetration. And, you know, internally, the way we think of it is even if you're able to get by 10, 15% of that online buy, this is a very, very sizable business for Nika. So at least for us personally, we're not, you know, lifting our heads and looking at competition left and right. I think we're really focused on trying to build something that is differentiated. And at least for me, maintaining and protecting that differentiation is the number one priority, and that's our right to win. Uh, so I'm not obsessed with, you know, gaining market share at the cost of, of the other folks. It's more about Let's get the paddle pie that we really like and we really believe in. Um, you know, moving forward, uh, you, you sort of touched on what about the growth over the last couple of quarters. I personally am trying to look at the business on a year-on-year basis rather than a sequential quarter basis. I think on a year-on-year basis, we're talking about 168% GMV growth. We showed you some slides that compared the fashion journey to the beauty journey. Uh, by any metric, the fashion growth has been explosive over the last couple of years. So I'd, uh, I, I'm personally trying to look at it on year-on-year. The thing with sequential quarters is that there's always one seasonality at play. Two, there are always judgments you take every quarter when you're trying to, you know, again, balance the profitability and growth equation. And three, in every quarter, I'm always trying to set up the right marketing metrics that takes us into the next year um, and really fuels us for the next year. So, um, you know, not sort of saying that the sequential growth that you've seen is what you will continue to see at all, but just saying that I'm trying to look at it on a year-on-year basis. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from the line of Rohit Chaudhia. Uh, Rohit, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Vijit, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just three small questions, just trying to understand your numbers better. One, uh, 
uh, the bridge between your NSV and revenue from ox for various segments. Uh, if my understanding is right, uh, the bridge in fashion, uh, sorry, in, in the BPC segment would primarily be ad revenues. Fashion would be two elements, ads, which is, uh, you know, a kicker and, and, and then there is a take rate element. If you could just throw some light on, on you know, this, this bridge in the two segments. Yeah, I think that's correct. So uh, NSV, uh, so BPC is a inventory led model. So revenue is quite similar to NSV, uh, except that there's an incremental revenue on advertisement, which is not part of the product revenue. So that's correct. And in terms of fashion, uh, yes, NSV is a number which is uh, what customer pays net of taxes. Uh, and what we get in p and is uh, commission that we earn from the brands uh, because it's a predominantly marketplace business, but we also get some revenue on advertisement, even in fashion. And we also get some revenue on shipping fee, et cetera. Yes, Arun, thank you. Uh, second question, how has, you know, this matrix shipments per order moved? So let's say against the 32 million orders last year across the two segments, what were the number of shipments? I'm just trying to understand, uh, are you, are you, you know, still breaking your orders into multiple shipments to ensure, you know, better consumer experience. Mm. So yeah, I, would... uh, I think uh, we have some data on that. Uh, we do, uh, we do send, uh, you know, the Lux orders separately. Uh, however, if you see during beginning of the year, because of COVID, April, May, June, our uh, split shipment ratio was very adverse, which has since been brought down. Uh, and there is improvement in that. Plus, we also now have regional warehouses, then thereby reducing our uh, air shipment costs. So we are doing a fair amount of work to manage our fulfillment costs better. And you will see the benefit of that going forward. Arvind, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to add one, one, one thing. I think, um, you know, uh, actually, we believe that uh, split shipment, uh, you know, consumer getting multiple packages for the same order is not a good consumer experience. And so we've always been focused on bringing that that split shipment ratio down. Uh, what I would say is it was never that adverse for us. We, we've never been a company that has had a very adverse split shipment ratio. I think it was slightly more adverse than usual in the first couple of months of the year because of the COVID impact. But all of the investment we've made in building out a good regional network of warehouses and also reducing and also a better inventory management across our warehouses, I think, that is the investment that you've seen in the fulfillment expense numbers in terms of building out the capacity. Uh, uh, but uh, you will see the, you, we're, we're starting to see the benefit of that in terms of the split shipment ratio coming to very, very healthy levels in the past couple of months. And uh, as a result, the consumer experience is obviously better. And of course, the fulfillment expenses also are, are trending lower. So just quick last question, if you could uh, give us a sense of the breakup of your marketing spends, uh, you know, between performance and brand. So that is not there in this presentation. And unfortunately, as a result, we won't be able to share it. Uh, but uh, you, uh, I, I don't know how to guide you on that. But um, uh, because, you know, it's not just uh, performance and brand. There are also support uh, and uh, fixed costs of uh, managing the MarTech function. So unfortunately, we won't be able to. But as a philosophy, we would like to spend uh, uh, predominantly on, on uh, performance marketing with some conscious budgets towards brand marketing so that we have a healthy upper funnel growth. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sachin Dikshit. Sachin, please go ahead. Hey, hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I quickly had a question regarding AOVs in BPC in particular, right? So if we use uh, the last three quarter numbers and we look at the annual AOV that uh, has been released, uh, AOV seems to have dipped quite sharply in Q4. Like it has dipped to 1660, roughly if my math is right, uh, from, from somewhere like a 1960 sort of a number in Q3. So is that normal should uh, like, uh, or, or there are some other factors that are driving that? Yeah, uh, maybe I'll come in here. So I think the, uh, there is obviously a seasonality in AOV numbers also. If you look at uh, quarter four AOV, 1763 in, uh, BPC, which is quite similar to last year, same quarter. So last year also it was 1732. So part of it is seasonality, part of it also 
because we have actually invested back uh, the efficiency that we realized into uh, fulfillment network expansion right we spoke about moving from national fulfillment strategy to regional fulfillment strategy by expanding fulfillment centers regionally closer to customer that has brought down our cost of shipment uh, so our unit economics has improved and some part of it we are plowing back by reducing the uh, minimum shipping value that a customer can book a free shipping for so in quarter 4 we have reduced our shipping threshold to make it more affordable to let's say tier 2 tier 3 or mass customer who is conscious about shipping charges and that uh, that also brings down little bit of uh, aov versus uh, what we were having in let's say in h1 so it's is uh, a bit a neutral in a way that you know the efficiency that we get from fulfillment cost reduction we are plowing it back to make it more affordable to customers uh, reaching deeper and nearer to customers got it thanks so uh, just one more question quickly on ordering frequency uh so in fashion for example uh, we do understand like there are number of new users who came into picture in fy22 which which could have driven the ordering frequency down to something like a 2.97 for the year uh how do you see this ordering frequency panning out over time like do you see this will mature it somewhere around this 3 3.5 sort of a range or it can go up to something like 5 or this um so to be honest you know uh, from a consumer cohort behavior perspective on beauty we had a very sticky and uh, very um, uh, very very valuable cohort and we used to see uh, all individual cohorts behave in a similar way making us believe that that was an inherent customer behavior to some extent uh, it was like a little bit affected during covid period because mainly makeup having been affected you know out of that cohort and uh, skin and hair, hair and person ke had gained a bit so there were these contrasting trends uh, however um, that beauty co- cohort behavior is coming back to pre covid levels uh, but still little more way to go for uh, COVID, you know the entire amount of uh, large um, celebration and and the entire uh, all the patterns of out of home behavior coming back in full scale you know as they come back in full scale you'll see more positive impact uh definitely fashion is in very early stage of our growth journey uh with fashion customer cohort reasonably good in terms of repeat customer behavior uh but needs a lot more working on to get them to the level of uh repeat customer behavior that we see in beauty but we will work uh, on it and uh, we do believe that fashion is also a category where consumers uh, engage with the category pretty similar number of times as beauty i would think and hence uh, they should be similar in the long run yeah, i'll supplement that i think frequency of ordering uh, could actually go up uh, because of two reasons uh, as we spoke earlier that some of the adjacent categories are going faster because of uh, better focus and assortment that we have brought out there uh, and some of it is coming through personal care as well uh and in those kind of category it is generally more high higher frequency versus makeup skin care hair in terms of order pattern of ordering so that could expand frequency of ordering and also because we have brought down the shipping threshold to 300 rupees so many customers might uh, put smaller orders but more frequently uh, but like i said uh, we we are giving more assortment and choice and getting closer to customers so we believe that getting more Uh, orders and more frequently will not strain the pnl rather on a an annual consumption value basis i think we will be positive to get larger wallet share from the customers uh, thank you uh, the next question is from nihal jha nihal please go ahead hi good evening am i audible yes yes please go ahead Yes, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the strong performance. A uh, couple of questions from my side. First, on the fashion business, I, I just had this observation. I know we're looking at it on an annual basis. That our monthly average users has been more or less similar at uh, around 16 million, whereas the transacting users is something that has been increasing uh, uh, every quarter. 
and even in the previous quarter we did mention on the focus on conversion so i just wanted to confirm again that even this quarter the same thought process continued that the focus is on conversion rather than getting customers in, uh, into the funnel at this point in time oh uh, yeah it's a very interesting question uh, nihal and i i will uh, tell you that uh, as a company we are very focused on upper funnel we are very focused on middle funnel and also uh, lower funnel and while our primary objective is to focus on um on uh, conversions also but we also have to keep an eye on adding uh, healthily on the upper and middle funnel you know so uh, multiple objectives but a uh, very good strong hold on uh, on marketing uh, both from data perspective and what we are doing perspective so that we are able to optimize uh, the best outcomes sure so, so uh, what i would not say is that or uh, you know tv ads never make sense because they are upper funnel i think every every type of marketing has a role to play and we would do a mix and there is a very big emphasis on crm because for a large uh, customer database which is very active for us you know on beauty uh, crm should be a very big focus and so should it be for other areas also and if i i may just follow up that going forward the focus would be that this number keeps increasing so that it keeps feeding on into transacting customers into the future Uh, yeah absolutely i think conversion is something that as a you know as a company we're very very focused on we want to do more with the visits that we're getting and uh, as we say internally conversion is the work of so many things so relentless focus on assortment price availability uh, as, along with product uh, marketing features as well so yes that remains a focus and to me you know a, an improvement in conversion is just a constant reflection that you're strengthening the platform and doing the right thing for the customer so that will always be a focus Sure. Thank you so much. The second question was. Oh, I'm so sorry. And Nihal, uh, sorry. Uh, if we can just fit in Shiram Kapoor, who is the next uh, question here, and then you can jump back into the queue if possible. Uh, uh, can we please take the next question from Shiram Kapoor? Hi. Am I audible? Yes. I, uh, th- thanks thanks for the opportunity i just wanted to ask one question i see that you know in the balance sheet the other financial assets have uh, increased considerably this year compared to last year is that you know primarily a function of you know proceeds from the ipo that have gone into um, your deposits and you know just uh, if you could give some color on how you plan to deploy um, is it just are those the same funds from the ipo that you know you plan to deploy with the same strategy as as mentioned during the time of the ipo Yes, the IPO funds will be deployed in the same manner as disclosed in the IPO Correct. document. But we also have uh, uh, funds available through our profits that we are generating, our cash flow that we are generating. Uh, but uh, we continue to want to invest in stores, warehouses, um, you know, and also um, some amount of uh, investment is in new businesses, and also some amount of investment is in inventory uh, that we need to do our business better. Of course, it's been a tough environment from supply chain perspective so we've taken a little bit higher inventory bets you know so that we are uh, you know we are we don't face supply shortages so but similar as what we've been doing thank you okay okay uh, um great thanks thank you shiram um, if i can uh, you know squeeze in a question of my own uh, here um, you know i was just looking at the superstore expansion the number of alki and it went from 4 and a half thousand to 18000 in this quarter uh, and you did mention about some feet on street hirings to you know add these retail stores so just trying to understand a uh, are those stores acquired Uh, solely through feet on street or there's a little bit of self serve there as well and there is an element of self serve also but these are very early days uh, and uh, uh, also you know the the business had a good scale up um, in that quarter however when that happens we also have to keep building infrastructure to service that network so i think in early days it's very difficult for us to predict quarter on quarter growth because sometimes you know our networks are uh, slow at uh, expanding in line with the demand that we see so i think in early days of beauty we learned that one thing we should do is uh, believe in that growth and invest in infrastructure ahead of the growth and uh, i think that is to some extent we are doing it for beauty with our store rollout with our uh, even uh, physical store rollout as well as our warehouse rollout and uh, we'll have to do something similar even in the b2b business correct thank you 
uh, the the next question is from the line of Garima Mishra. Garima, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I had a couple of questions on the fashion business. Any timelines that you may have in your uh, mind as far as when this business can become EBITDA positive? And also now that you're seeing a much larger number of transacting customers in Nika fashion, is there any material change you observe as far as customer behavior on order returns are concerned? I think we can't make forward-looking statement on break-even. But if you know Nika, we are always working towards that uh, magical EBITDA break-even for each of the businesses as uh, as uh, early as possible, but in a manner that we are not depriving the business of a medium to longer term growth. Uh, so I think it will be a balance and affordability also in terms of, uh, you know, what we think is something that we would like to spend to build that business. But I think uh, for most of the e-commerce business, you know, showing near term profitability is a matter of stopping um, customer acquisition, but it's not really the right thing. If you're acquiring the right customer, you, uh, it is worthwhile to acquire that customer from a long-term value creation perspective. Yeah, and I think in terms of, you know, the next question around returns, that's uh, something that, you know, we've not uh, split out uh, and therefore it'll be difficult for me to comment. But what I will say is that, um, you know, I'm very focused on making sure that we're getting a very high quality customer. So we're really trying to keep out, um, you know, kind of that, um, that that often fraudulent return behavior that is prevalent across e-commerce in India. So trying to be very focused that the returns that we do get are from high quality customers who are truly struggling with product and size and so forth and doing a lot of work on our end, uh, both in terms of attracting the right customer, but then even after that, uh, weeding out the customers that you know could potentially have poor return behavior. And the result of that is definitely a return rate that is far better than what we hear and see amongst competition. Thank you. Uh, so uh, there's one last question from the line of Nihal Jam, a follow-up. Nihal, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much for that. Uh, just my pending question was that uh, in the quarter, we obviously announced the three investments into Earth, Rhythm, and the two other. Uh, just wanted to understand from a perspective of uh, the plan ahead, is this to build up uh, the private label portfolio and that's what the thought is, or could we look at exits for these kind of investments? And would there be more of it if I were to ask you this? One? Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, what we don't want to do is uh, we don't want to be a fund that invests in consumer companies with a view to exit. I think we would like to build a uh, build a company uh, which is a consumer company with a number of brand that it owns. Many of the brands are created in house organ. I mean, in our, through our own um, organic efforts, and there could be some brands when we come across certain brands that bring something incremental or they bring something. Uh, in an area that we don't have a current focus on, then we may acquire those, uh, but uh, with a clear path to uh, control over time. Thank you so much. Intention to control. Sometimes the path may not be already laid out, but we are intention to have control over time. Um, hi. Uh, sorry, I see one more hand raised. Uh, Falgin, that's okay with you to take this? Yeah, I let's know take we are... the last question. Yeah. yeah sure. Uh, the question is from Amit Sachdeva. Amit, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much and good evening. Sorry, I got disconnected in between. So my apologies if this has been asked earlier. Uh, so uh, my question is on uh, the e-store business. And I see that there's a, you know, in six months, there's a remarkable progress there as well. But if I do a rough math and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if there are some 18,000 uh, end retailers and then revenue, if I just make a rough guess about maybe it's 18, 90 crores, of revenue has been, uh, you know, GMB has been recorded here. So probably they're, you know, spending about lakh per outlet or some sort. Uh, I just want to know that basically what could be the ticket size? What is the total addressable market of those? And what is the minimum efficient scale that you need to reach that it becomes a bit of a profitable? I would reckon that because gross margin here would be half of that of your PPC margin because of the trade margins, et cetera. So how, how, how we should make sense of this business in terms of next four to five years perspective, what could be the size of revenue and probably a, a trajectory for this business? Oh uh, yeah, very interesting question, but these are very early days for us to be able to answer all of your questions with data. 
uh, one, couple of things I can tell you for sure is that this business cannot be done like a B2C business because like you said, inherently the gross margin available for the business is far lower than uh, what is available for a B2C business. And uh, keeping that in mind, uh, these uh, this business will have a very different uh, distribution network. Like it may have uh, warehouses much closer to the retail centers. Uh, it may also not be... Um, uh, it will also not uh, spend on marketing uh, costs for customer acquisition, especially if it is also spending on uh, feet on street to uh, to educate and convert the retailers and teach them the art of buying online. I st- strategically, I see um, um, you know a very very um, big opportunity here because uh, once you are um, uh, tied to the retailer, the kind of uh, value add you can do to tell him. What are the brands, new brands, new products that are likely to sell in his area? And what should he equip himself with? Uh, and how you, and we can also be that conduit to offer the best offers to them, to the retailer through our brand partners. And also um, educate them and educate them on the right conversation that they can engage with their clients and also give them, uh, uh, you know, working capital to buy those products, give them knowledge which uh, products and what quantity to buy. So I think it's a very powerful business model. We see that next 10 years of growth will be in this area, and Nika can definitely play this very successfully first in beauty, where we are backward integrating and we are in front of most of the brands, and we think we truly add value for them. And in future, we may also consider a couple of other categories that make sense given our business focus. Um, thank you. Th- that was the last question we can take today. Uh, thank you, Fagni, Anchit, Advita, and Arvind for doing this call. Thank you, Ankit. Um, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining, and hope you all have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.